This week's stranger story is about dead bones that come back to life. Stick around. Well, uh, welcome to week four of our series called Stranger Stories, where we are looking at some of the stranger stories from the Bible. Uh, the thing is, we, we all know that there are some weird stories in that, that book, in the Bible. Sometimes the church tends to ignore them or maybe look the other way, but we wanted to tackle a few of them head on because the truth is this. Some of the weirdest stories in the Bible can teach us some of the greatest things about God. And today's story is no exception, but first I want to tell you another story. I want to tell you this story about this incident that was incredible that happened when I was a teenager. It was October, it was 1987, and this little 18-month-old girl in Midland, Texas was walking with her two cousins in her backyard, and they came across a well. And if you were around back then, it would be really hard to have missed this going on, or at least what happened next, because this story began circulating on the news and the, the whole nation tuned in to this. This little 18 month old girl, Jessica McClure, sat on the edge of this well with her feet dangling in. And the, the well was exactly eight and three quarters inches in diameter. And when she went to stand up, she fell straight down. And the, the sheriff who was on the scene first, he knew that this was going to be a really complicated issue because she had dropped 20 feet down into the well where she was stuck. Uh, it was a place where the well was corroded and pinched in and below her was 70 more feet of open well space. So the sheriff began asking for help and the whole country began to tune in and sat on his edge, on the edge of its seat. Je Jessica McClure was stuck with no way out and hope for her survival was dwindling fast. Maybe there's a time or moment in your life where you felt like you have come to the end of yourself. There's nothing else you can do. There's nowhere else to go. Things look pretty hopeless and you feel like you're stuck. You're at the bottom of a well and you don't know where to turn. Perhaps with a particular situation or a diagnosis or a marriage issue or a relationship issue or with a mental health thing happening where you end up so discouraged that you feel like there's not a way out that you can see. This series, Stranger Stories, I, I believe that we save the best stranger story for last. And I, and I believe God wants to speak to those of us who feel stuck, who feel like life is maybe passing us by, who feel like I'm not sure where I go from here. I need God to do something. He's going to have to show up and he's going to have to show up big if this is going to get any better right now. Th this story is from the book of Ezekiel, which was written by a, a prophet of Israel named Ezekiel, um, mostly written during the time of the Babylonian exile around 575 BC when Jerusalem had been overthrown and the people of Israel were completely scattered. It's a book that's, that's honestly very hard to understand. It's full of prophetic visions. It's full of symbolic language. And uh, it's all there though to call Israel to repentance in front of God because they were straying from him and to describe to them what God is like. And so Ezekiel, it's like he paints this picture for us of who God is. And it's kind of like when an artist starts off with a bunch of paint splattered all over the canvas and you're wondering, where is, is she going with this? Where is he going with this? But it gradually begins to take shape as you watch them paint. And, and by the end, you start to see an image come into focus. That's what this story is doing. It's from later in the book of Ezekiel and it's finally bringing God into focus. They were asking this question, what's God really like? We're in exile, we don't have a home, things look hopeless, is he ever going to show up? Maybe those questions echo how you feel 
too. Well, th th this story is about God wanting to restore Israel, wanting to breathe new life into this nation and these people who really felt stuck and like their lives were amounting to nothing and, and how he wanted to, to bring them back together. But it's also about what he wants to do in you and what he wants to do in me. It points to his heart for not only the people of, of Israel in 550 BC, but his heart toward us and everybody that he has created. And so I, I want us to read this with an eye on what he wants to do in us. Because Ezekiel paints this very clear picture of who God is and what he wants to do in you. And if, if you've ever felt like you're at the end of your rope or you're stuck at the bottom of the well and you can't budge, you can't move yourself out or forward or up or down or you can't free yourself at all, I believe these words today are for you. And so, so here's what the prophet Ezekiel writes. The, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He, he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. So, so, so God sets Ezekiel, and possibly in a vision, out in the middle of a valley and all around him, all he sees were bones, right? Like it sounds like he's on the, the set of some kind of weird, scary movie. He takes Ezekiel and he makes him walk back and forth over the valley and it's covered. It's covered in, in bones and bones, he says that were very dry, meaning there's nothing here that's remotely alive. These bones used to be alive because they're bones, but they aren't alive any longer. There was, there was nothing living in this valley. It's a statement about Israel and their existence without God. Basically, it's also a statement about us. It's, it's what our souls look like if we live life without God. It's what happens when we willfully choose our own way and our own selfishness really over him. When we choose our own path and ignore his, when we don't invite him in, when we don't worship or honor him, we, we don't allow him to be front and center in our lives. This is the status of our soul without God, a valley full of dry bones. What he's showing Ezekiel is, is this, that the natural direction that we are headed without God is death. Not only death of our bodies, but death of our souls. Not only a physical death, but a spiritual death. And God's saying, hey, life without me isn't life at all. It's actually death. If you haven't begun a relationship with God, this should concern you. So it goes on. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you. I will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. In other words, Ezekiel, hey, call out to these bones. I want you to call out to them and, and say that God is saying, I'm going to make breath into you. You're going to come back to life. I'm going to cover you with, with tendons and skin, and then I'm going to breathe my own breath into you. Now, you might feel today like life is, is hopeless. It's not. You may feel like things are at their end. They're not. You may have given up on your marriage. God has not. You may not know where to turn. God does. You, you may think you're on the last chapter in your book. God's just written the introduction to your book. What he is saying is this. When God is here, there's always hope. When God's here, there's always hope. You can't do it, but he can. You can't breathe life into your own soul, but he can. And it's not only that he can, it's that he wants to. It's that he will. It goes on to say this, so I, I prophesied as I was commanded, Ezekiel says, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. God's word is that powerful. Think back with me to 
Genesis chapter 1, the, the story of the creation of the universe and of our world and every single thing in it. God creates light, he creates darkness, he creates oceans and, and the land, and he creates incredibly beautiful things like Maui and Alaska and, and every kind of animal on this earth. And then he created us. And do you know what preceded every one of those created things? The words, and God said. And God said. He spoke and it came to be. My words don't have quite the same effect. Do yours? Like I remember when my kids were younger and if I was lucky, I would speak and they would deliver the remote control right into my hands or perhaps a refreshing beverage to me if I was lucky. God's words bring life. They brought life into existence in our world through creation and they brought life into those dry bones through his word. And that same word that brought you and me to life, that gave us breath to breathe, also wants to recreate life in the deepest, deadest parts of us. The word of God has the power to recreate life in you. That's the power of his word. Ezekiel says, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. An army rose up from the dead field. A living, breathing army came alive and stood on its feet. And it's this illustration of one of the, the deepest, the most profound, most God-like things about God. God wants to breathe new life into dead things. And that includes us. What does he want to breathe new life into? He can, he can breathe new life into our marriages and into our relationships with our, with our kids or with our parents or our brothers or sisters or, or friends who have been distanced or even estranged. I, I believe that that includes our emotions that he can breathe new life into, our intellect, our mental state, our sexuality, all of these areas of brokenness that we have, God wants to breathe new life into these dead things. And at the deepest level, it means our souls that God wants to breathe new life into our dead souls, and he will do that. He'll do that for you today. You just have to ask. This is why Jesus came. He didn't come just to teach us or just to be our friend. He didn't come simply to usher in some kind of political kingdom or, or, or only to focus on social justice issues. He came to raise dead things to life, dead things that include us. Here's how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians in the New Testament. He says it like this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. That Wednesday afternoon passed and into Wednesday evening and, and baby Jessica was still stuck in that well. People were going to do whatever it took though to get her out. There were stories of, of men flying equipment in just to see if it could possibly help. They flew in an expert and he thought that the best strategy was to move over from the hole and dig down like 22 feet down and then dig across and come uh, back up underneath her and pull her out. And so they began that process. They began to dig this complicated hole. 24 hours had passed though. And then like 36 hours had passed and then 48 hours passed. And for two days, this girl was down in this well. And so as they began to dig down and dig the tunnel across, there was all of this anxiety and emotion and tension all over the country. And as they began to tunnel across, something unexpected happened. They, they, they hit a wall of solid rock and, and you could see the looks of desperation on the workers' faces. What were they going to, be, to, to do? Well, they were able to get some type of, of a hydro drill and FedEx got a plane and they flew it out and they got, got it and they brought it back and, and they brought it down into the well and they began to cut through that rock. And this man named Robert O'Donnell, who was a paramedic, was sent down to go into the hole 58 hours in, two and a half days to get little Jessica McClure out. And so he goes down and the whole country is, is waiting and then he comes back up without her. 
And he's visibly shaken and he said that he could touch her, but she was jammed in so tight that he couldn't move her. And so at 58 hours in, he's given instructions to go back into the hole one more time. And the pediatric doctor who was on the scene told him, you do whatever you have to do to get her out. If you have to break a leg or an arm, you get her out. And so he goes back in and there's this amazing tension that's there and now they waited. And finally, O'Donnell emerged with Jessica in his arms. And the entire nation went crazy. The entire nation celebrated and a few weeks later, 40,000 people showed up to a parade to celebrate the rescue of baby Jessica McClure. And this, this little girl who was facing certain death was brought out of the ground alive. Jesus didn't come to take you from uh, good to great or from even bad to good. He came to take you from dead to alive. Because the truth is this, in our sin, we are dead, as, as dead as that valley of dry bones. We're stuck, my friends. And it's only through the word of God, which was embodied in the son of God, Jesus, that we can be made alive again and have a relationship with God. And so I'm inviting you to respond to him today. The only way that you can, by inviting him into your life, by calling out for rescue, by laying your life down at his feet, by saying yes to him today and beginning a relationship with Jesus, it starts with a simple heartfelt prayer. It starts with a simple prayer. So will you pray with me? Jesus, I admit that I can't do life on my own. In fact, I'm dead in my own sin. Without you, there really isn't any hope. And so today I'm saying I believe that, that what you did on the cross, you did for me. That was your rescue plan for me when I was stuck. You died so that I can live. Your offer is to move me from death to life. And so today I confess my sin. I ask you to come into my life and I'm saying yes to you today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that with me today, we'd love to know. Would you take a minute? Would you go to lovelkn.org and on that page you'll find our connection card. You can fill it out and you can let us know that you prayed with me today and we can help you take a next step on your journey with Christ. Thanks for being with me today. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, and you are my portion. And you are my hiding place. And I believe you are the way the truth and the light I believe you are the way the truth and the light I believe through every blessing through every promise through every breath I take that you are provider oh and you are protector and you are the one I love and I believe you are the way the truth and the light I believe you are the way the truth and the light, I believe you are. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to Because they can't stay long when I'm here with you 
And it's a new horizon And I'm set on you And you meet me here today With mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I believe you are the way The truth And the light truth and the light I believe you are well it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay alone when I believe The truth, the light, I believe you are the way, yes you are Lord, the truth, you're the light, I believe you are the way, the truth, and the light. Well, each and every week, we want to offer you a next step to take. And so here are a few that you might be interested in. The first is by visiting our website, lovelkn.org. There you can find information about who we are as a church, ways to get connected, and you can find our connection card. Now, when you fill that connection card out, it not only allows us to know that you are here today, but allows us to get to know you just a little bit better. A next step that you might be interested in taking today is taking a step into giving. We view generosity as a lifestyle, as an act of worship, and as a response to God's goodness. We never want giving to be done out of guilt or shame, but always motivated by joy. If you're interested in taking a step into giving, you can do that two ways. One, by going to lovelkn.org slash give, or by texting the dollar amount to 84. Three, two, one. And last but not least, maybe a next step for you is to visit us for an in-person worship experience. We meet at the Oak Street Mill every Sunday at 9 and 1030, and we would love to see you there. Thank you so much for watching this today. We hope you have a great day and look forward to seeing you soon.